Hey, everybody. It's Thursday, December 17th. And as you can see here in the aim today, the goal for this video is to talk about the centrifugal force. And as you can probably tell when you open this, uh, the video today is quite short. And that is because the only other topic really that we have to cover in circular motion is kind of long. And it's something that has a lab attached to it, which unfortunately we are not going to be able to do. And so I would rather devote just one single video to that topic so we can just discuss the whole thing in one shot. And since today was supposed to be a snow day that you were robbed of, I think, you know, you guys in particular in this class have been working pretty hard. And so you deserve a little bit of a break. So this should be pretty quick. The centrifugal force is the main focus of what we want to talk about today. And I want to talk about the centrifugal force today for two reasons. The first reason is that I think it's a really important concept for circular motion. And so, like, it's definitely something that you're going to want to know about. But particularly, the centrifugal force is also going to be important because it's going to help you with some of the kinds of questions that you've been seeing on recent homework assignments. For example, this question that you had on the homework that was due Tuesday. This question in particular was asking you to discuss the motion of a box from two separate vantage points from the vantage point of a person standing on the ground, that would be this person over here, and this person standing on the truck, which is accelerating. And the key point here, which is very important for everybody to understand, is that Newton's first law, the law of inertia, which says objects in the absence of an external force will continue doing what they're doing, essentially, only works in inertial reference frames, that is, in reference frames where the object is not accelerating. And so if we go all the way back in the slides to October 29th, actually, then you'll see, and of course that video was posted on October 29th, so you can go back and watch the beginning of it if you want. We took a look at this question here, talking about why a kid falls backward in a wagon when you give the wagon a sharp pull forward. And so what we said was, there's a thing called an inertial reference frame that works or that moves only uh, at a constant velocity. There's a thing called a non-inertial reference frame, which is accelerating, essentially. And Newton's first law does not work in the accelerated reference frames. It only works in the inertial reference frame. And so the point here, as we said, is that in accelerated reference frames, sometimes the motion of objects will appear as though they're caused from some force. But really, they are just a product of the fact that the frame is accelerating. And so we said a perfect example of this is like a coffee cup on a dashboard. If a car accelerates forward, it seems like the coffee cup is flying back at you. But really, you're in an accelerated reference frame. And so you're losing sight of the fact that, well, actually, the object is really just sitting there at rest. And you're moving into the coffee cup. The reason why you can't fully understand that from the reference frame of a person who's accelerating is because in your own reference frame, which would be true for the person sitting in the car, everything is at rest. And so the idea was the person in the accelerated reference frame can only explain the motion of the coffee cup is to say there must have been a force acting on it. It wasn't moving. Now it is. It accelerated. And so there must have been a force acting on it and that that force is called a fictitious force. Now, of course, it's a pretty good question to ask, I think. Like, why are we talking about fictitious forces at all when we're talking about uniform circular motion? And that's because when an object is moving in a circular path, it's accelerating. And so the centrifugal force is just the fictitious force that we need to invent for circular motion. So as it says here, the definition of the centrifugal force is it's a fictitious force which must be used to explain the motion of objects moving in a circle when viewed from the vantage point of an accelerating reference frame. In this particular example for circular motion, that would be the reference frame of the object which is moving in a circle. 
And I really want to take the time to explain this in as much detail as possible. And so that's what we're going to go through next. And for this example here, we're going to use the example of a ball on a string swung around in a circle. I'd like you to take a second to pause this video here and make sure you write down that definition. And when you hit play, we'll move on. Okay. So I want you to imagine a ball on a string being swung around in a circle. And let's just say for the purposes of argument here that this ball is moving purely in a horizontal circle. So like a person is holding it up and the string just so happens to be at a pure right angle at all times. And so the circle it's moving around in is essentially lies in a plane that is parallel to the floor. And so we want to consider the motion of this object from two reference frames. The first reference frame we're going to consider it from is from the uh, point of view of an inertial reference frame. So this is you looking at the ball, watching it from off to the side as the person is swinging it around. And so your observations are pretty straightforward. You see the ball swinging in a circle where the centripetal force is provided by the tension. Now, of course, a perfectly reasonable question to ask here is, okay, if the ball is swinging in a circle and there's a force acting on it toward the center of the circle, then why isn't it actually moving towards the center of the circle? Why isn't it falling in to the circle? And the answer here is pretty clear based on everything we've said for circular motion so far. The ball's inertia prevents it from falling into the circle. And that gives it a tangential velocity. The circular motion, as we've said before, is a battle between the inertia of the object, which makes it want to move in a straight line, and the force acting on the object, which makes it want to move toward the center of the circle. Notice, the reason why I've been saying it's a battle is because like neither of them wins. That's an important thing to realize. The inertia, if it was left on its own, would have the ball move in a straight line. The centripetal force, if it was left on its own, would have the object move toward the center of the circle. Neither of those things happen. What happens is, of course, instead of the object moving in a straight line from where it is or moving towards the center of the circle, it follows a circular path. That's circular motion in a nutshell. But of course, perfectly reasonable other point of view is from the point of view of the ball itself, which, because it's moving in a circular path, is experiencing centripetal acceleration and thus is in an accelerated reference frame. So the key idea here, again, we've already kind of covered this, but just to be clear about it, in an accelerated reference frame, the frame is accelerated, as we say, because in circular motion, the direction of the velocity of the ball continuously changes. And so now, of course, we have to consider what the ball would see. The ball, if you were sitting on the ball, or you were the ball itself, you would obviously feel the force from the rope, the tension acting on the ball. And so the ball swings in a circle where the centripetal force is provided by the tension. But in this reference frame, the ball is at rest because in your own reference frame, you're always at rest. Think about it from the point of view of like a microscopic version of you sitting on the ball. Yeah, you're moving around in a circle and you see the whole room moving around you. But every time you look down, the ball is right there. And you're on the same spot of the ball that you were originally sitting at. That's what we mean when we say everything in your own reference frame is at rest. And of course, now we have a perfectly reasonable question to ask again. Well, from this point of view, why doesn't the ball fall into the circle? And here's the trick. We can't say in this reference frame, or I should say from the point of view of this reference frame, that the ball doesn't fall into the circle because of its inertia. Because the object in this reference frame is at rest. 
And so you can't say, well, it's just going to continue with its velocity in a straight line because it doesn't have a velocity from the point of view of this reference frame. It's at rest. And so the key detail here is that the only possible way that we can explain how an object that is at rest is remaining at rest, even though there is a centripetal force acting on it towards the center of the circle, is if there is another force acting the other way, canceling it out. And that force is fictitious because it doesn't actually exist. It is just perceived by the person in the accelerated reference frame. So as I wrote here, the conclusion is that there must be a force acting away from the center of the circle, preventing the ball from falling into the circle. This fictitious force is called the centrifugal force. It is a fictitious force. One of the better, I think, practical applications of a discussion of the centrifugal force is talking about the blade of a propeller on a plane. Those things are always moving in circular motion, at least when the engine is on, right? And so as I hope you guys know, usually the kids in the AP class know, when a plane engine is on, powered, in motion, whatever you want to say, the blade of every propeller stretches. It elongates. It gets longer. And it's a pretty good question to ask, well, why does that happen? Most kids in 12th grade in shop, and I know that doesn't apply to all of you, but most kids who have taken this class before in 12th grade in shop can say, oh, well, it happens because of the centrifugal force. And I say like, oh, cool, explain that. And they say like, well, you know, it's just the centrifugal force and it, it stretches. And that's about it. But now we can describe that in great detail. The tip of the propeller blade has an inertia, which wants to carry it in a straight line. And so at every point, the particles at the end of the propeller blade are like tugging away from the propeller blade itself as like the drive shaft or the crankshaft, whatever you guys call it, um, is turning the thing around in a circle. And so the idea is, because the inertia is constantly tugging it away, it stretches. But if you consider it from the point of view of the propeller blade, then you would just say, well, the tip of the propeller blade is at rest. There's a centrifugal force pulling the tip of the propeller, or excuse me, there's a centripetal force pulling the tip of the propeller blade in. And the only possible way we can explain the propeller not completely collapsing on itself is that the tip of the propeller blade also has a centrifugal force acting on it, which is why it stretches. Both explanations are equally valid. And so the answer is, it's relative. It depends on who you ask. You ask somebody in an inertial reference frame, the answer is it's because of its inertia. You ask somebody in the reference frame of the propeller, then the answer is it's, it's the centrifugal force. And that's the idea. The notes on this slide are extremely important. Take a second to pause this video here and write that down. And when you hit play, we'll move on to one last note. And the last thing we need to say for today, just as we wrap it up, to be totally clear, because this is one of the most common misconceptions that I see about circular motion, to be clear, in any case, the centrifugal force is not a third law reaction to the centripetal force. It is not. Let's consider the previous example with the ball on the string. Newton's third law says that if there is a force of tension exerted by the string on the ball, the third law reaction to that is a force exerted by the ball on the string. That's not what we're saying the centrifugal force is. We're saying the centrifugal force acts on the ball. For sure, it acts on the ball. 
but we only need to say it acts on the ball to explain the motion of the objects when we are looking at them from the point of view of an accelerated reference frame, because while Newton's first law is an extremely useful tool, it doesn't work in an accelerated reference frame. And with that, that's it for today. Have a good one, everybody.